But now it's time to, to hold that conversation for later and join us for this uh, um, wonderful uh, session, which is uh, about our fabulous collection of people's portraits. And the people's portraits at Girton is the fruit of a, a, an amazing and wonderful collaboration and partnership between the college and the Royal Society of Portrait Painters. I must say that it was the brainchild of my predecessor, Dame Marilyn Strathern, and the member of the Royal Society of Portrait Painters who painted her portrait, which was Daphne Todd, who happened to be the first woman president of the RP. And somehow between the two of them, while they were obviously sitting and painting and sitting and painting, they had this brilliant idea of getting a set of people's portraits, which would be a set of portraits, which instead of being people who are normally have their portrait painted and pay money for it, there will be a set of people who were painted for love, not money, and who came from a cross-section of everyday life. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it happens, it happens. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and that is how the people's portrait was born. Por portraits were born at the turn of the millennium. And every year, at least one, sometimes two, new portraits have come to the collection. And uh, it's a collection which is owned by the RP, but which is on permanent exhibition here at Girton. And every year we have a wonderful event like this where we um, unveil a new portrait. Uh, we hear from the portrait painter and sometimes as well from the sitter, who are a father and son act uh, on this occasion, um, uh, 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 Peter and, uh, Pete and Toby Brown. Uh, and we also invite someone to come uh, and talk a little bit about... Um, about about some area of their own art and art practice that engages uh, with the idea behind the people's portraits. So we're going to start off today uh, with um, uh, a, a, an introduction to this idea by Carol Adlam. Now, Carol is a, an artist uh, and a, a writer and a, a graphic novelist uh, and of, of many talents. She does many, many different things uh, and has wonderful accolades for her work. But the most exciting thing about her work for Girton College at the moment is that she is the Mary Amelia Cummins Harvey Visiting Fellow Commoner, which is a wonderful role that we're allowed to offer, which enables an artist like Carol to come here and do her work. And I must say, it's been an absolutely uh, fantastic and fascinating experience, which I'm sure you'll be hearing more about, more about from uh, other directions quite soon, if you, if you weren't, in fact, in her session uh, earlier today. So, Carol, you're going to talk um, about a, a series of, of our paintings, aren't you? And it's got a, a, a catchy title... Uh, because it's on the, the dentist, the former thief, the hairdresser, the student, story time in portraiture. Carol Adlam, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, mistress, and thank you very much, everyone. And um, I'd just like to say that I'm in my very final hours of being the Mary Amelia Cummins Harvey, or a, a Mary Amelia, um, as this is my final day today. So it's lovely to be here. Um, thank you. So as Susan just said, I work in narrative illustration, that is a form of visual storytelling that combines image and text and places images in sequence to tell stories. And we see examples of this all around us today in advertising, in animation, in comics, in graphic novels indeed. Um, and narrative illustration is really, I think, all about time. So it exploits our propensity to generate meaning from the space between images. That is, um, you know, or what illustrators, being prosaic sorts, like to call the gutter. <laughs> so when two or more images are placed next to each other in a frame or on pages, on film, we instinctively read them as boxes of time. Um, and, and this may seem a very modern way of doing things, but of course it's been around for as long as we've been human and we've magic story out of flickering firelight and jumps between clouds and stars. Portraiture, then, seems to have little to do with this form of storytelling, being self-evidently about the single image. But I've been thinking about how these two art forms might speak to each other. Um, so that's fine art and narrative illustration. And I think that story time or a narrative understanding of time is one way of parsing the art that we see around us today in the college. Um, and I'm going to start... Well, I'll move on to the people's portraits, but I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the portraits in the wider college collection... Um, starting with none other than Emily Davies. So these are the portraits that you'll see in the dining hall. And my contention is that these 
rather than invoking time, they invoke a quasi-religious idea, if you like, of presence. Um, they are self-contained, centrally framed. The face is the key, not the body, which is often cut off. Um, and there is little to invite us to read outside the image itself. So compositionally, the sitter is strapped within a rigid triangle. Our gaze is held on the apex, it's pinned on the face, on those sharp eyes of the sitter that stand metonymically for sharp minds. Props, if they're present, serve as re symbolic reinforcement of the central message. And as compositional girdering, so just have a look at those knitting needles there. Again, that's the, the bottom of the triangle. Um, this is Fanny Metcalf, of course. So we see such props, um, a festal gown here, an academic scroll here, um, another festal gown and so on. Um, and they, they speak not, I think, of bodies in time, but of minds out of time, timeless, eternal. They speak of great time to invoke Bergson um, and not the small time of the quotidian. Perhaps in some of the portraits, uh, we see the development of different sorts of invocations of time. Um, if we compare the two portraits of uh, Mary Cartwright, here the, the formal portrait, and the less formal one as well, we see these two different strands of storytelling begin to emerge. And again, indeed, in the portrait you might spot over there in the corner, the portrait of Alice Simmon, we start to see the idea of somebody who might just get up out of her chair the minute the portrait is, is finished. So, in other words, the, the portraits that I, I think we see in the dining hall are not um, about sequence. They're not snapshots in a chronology. Um, somebody might say, but what about the mistress's portrait, if I may discuss that for a, a very brief moment. Um, it is indeed two juxtaposed images, one on top of the other. Um, but is it a sequence? I would actually say that it, it refers back to a more medieval, iconic tradition. It is not, again, about temporality, but about timelessness. It is, in fact, I think, about the office, although, of course, the artist may disagree with me. Um, the office through which successive humans pass in a model of a peaceful transition of power. So, the people's portraits, however, speak to us rather differently about time. Here we have Fran Maranzi bursting through the wall towards us. Um, we have Robert Grant, furniture maker, as he moves his lathe, and Ron and Ray Pet, butchers, as they go about their, their trade. And indeed, Kim French, as she pauses for perhaps a moment in time to think about her role as nanny or, or uh, mother or caretaker of a child. So... I'm moving now to the three portraits I want to discuss today, which are The Dentist by Claude Walker, Robert Race, the former thief, and Saeed Dyes, the hairdresser, I'm starting with The Dentist. And indeed, he seems to come straight out of that portrait tradition we see in the dining hall. There are no props to indicate his profession. He is solid, a blocky triangle composed of a small cube sitting atop a larger cube. We see only his upper body, and at first glance, he fits into that same tradition. But look more closely. The absence of props is not just convention, but it is, I think, a telling or a speaking omission, a storytelling omission. He has no props because nobody wants to be reminded of them in his line of work. <laughs> our eyes are drawn to his face, as tradition demands, but are immediately deflected by that gleam in his glasses, the startled look in his eye, his raised eyebrow, and the look of alarm, or is it calculation, in his <laughs> slightly parted lips. And then our eyes might fall back to his hands, and they linger there, perhaps uneasily, on the sort of hands you'd want nowhere near your mouth, <laughs> with their hammy, queasily blood-red fingers. I should have possibly warned you about this moment. <laughs> and, then, and then we see that his shirt cuff is traced by the faintest, thinnest line of red on its inner <laughs> line. So... <clears throat> Like a merchant or a prince in a Renaissance portrait, he rests his, uh, his elbow casually on a ledge. But in his, his, his case, the ledge it may be the white of a surgical cloth, which we've already seen glinting in his glasses. So perhaps you can see this now, that this is not, I think, a moment out of time, but a very specific moment in time. It is all about inescapable embodiment, our corporeal and temporal existence. It's that moment we know and perhaps fear as we sit in the medical specialist's office. 
His body turns away from us with its, it, uh, our own flawed body with its imperfect teeth and he is ready to start work. <laughs> it's the moment when the expert glances at you and makes an assessment. The question, so what seems to be the problem, hangs in the air. That's its beforehand. And the afterhand is the moment when we submit to the dentist's chair, perhaps to the sound of a distant dentist's drill. And the perfectly placed vertical division of planes behind him sets up this pattern, light, dark, before, after, the dentist sitting in between. So this is a standalone image, I think, that whispers of narrative sequence. I'm going to show you just a section of the former thief. Um, it's currently not on display because of the um, renovation work that's underway. Um, but my point here is actually not about the identity of the thief, but in fact about um, the paratext that goes along with it. The label that accompanies the painting notes that the original title was The Anonymous Thief, that the sitter had a code of thievery, no houses, just shops, and that he was hoping to go straight. And in this context, the absence of the tools of his trade, there are none um, in this painting, reads more like a moment in a still unfolding self-narrative. The glint in his eye hints to the moment after the portrait is finished, when the man who aspired to be a former thief slips away as ephemeral and ultimately unknowable as those quivering, hasty brush strokes that you see there the faded pinks blending with the ochre background. So again, we have that moment before, and then most specifically, most definitely, the moment after. What happens next is the question that gives meaning to this image. Those two images, though, are quite unusual in the context of the people's portraits because they have no props in them. For the reasons I've explained, I think they are. These are storytelling emissions, deliberate, deictic emissions, if you like. So let's look at the Saeed Dyes, the hairdresser, a favorite of mine. Um, and it's, this is full of props. You can see the brushes, the hairsprays, that mysterious wormwood-like liquid that all hairdressers seem to have, um, and the sequence of mirrors. Compositionally, the world spills off the edges of the image, outwards and upwards. The mirrors like ladders leading us up and away into the depth of the picture plane and into the depths of endless mirrored recursion. So we, the viewers, are strangely located. We float somehow above the client and the hairdresser. The space is broken, jagged, divided, and articulated by blinds and light. And we are perhaps unsure of which of these figures are real and which is reflection. So space is unstable, and time spills out from this moment as well. And then once again, I contend that this is a moment we all know well. It's the pause after the final touches have been put in place when the mirror is held up and you see yourself from the angles at which you never usually see yourself, behind, above, and without your entire horizon of being on display. We know intimately the moment that follows this one, where you stand up, brush off tiny hairs, pay, and you float away, convinced for an hour or two by the hairdresser's magic trick. <laughs> and I should just, I'd like to quote here a, a, a couple of lines from a poem by Peter Sparks. I'm not sure if he's in the room here. Um, but he sent me this poem, which he wrote about the hairdresser, which gives a slightly different reading. And it, it goes as, as follows. Two swift, deft flicks quickly consigned to well-swept tiles her fine-cut jet. His mirror raised in threat and scissors wet to drill her down and break her will. But, all defiance now, she plots revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, whichever way you read it, I think this portrait too is all about time, visual storytelling. And here, very sophisticated, layered and refractive. And it asks us explicitly to reflect on the implied temporal dispositions in the different portrait traditions that we see around us. And the painting that will be presented today by Pete Brown, um, about, of, of Toby, of course, and congratulations, Toby, um, is actually, is, I think, I, had a, I was fortunate enough to have a quick preview of it, so I, I think also that same idea of temporality um, obtains in it. Um, the picture plane is full of objects, again, you'll see papers, folders, the obligatory laptop of the, the student. Um, compositionally divided into three planes, foreground of the table, um, the background of the wall, fireplace as a crammed mantelpiece, um, decanters and mirror, and then in the slender middle ground sits Toby. And so he is, I think, in this painting, 
uh, although we know the outcome now. This was when you were about to apply to Girton, I believe. Um, but, so he is a threshold figure. He sits between past and future and raises that question once again of what will come next. Thank you. Now, ordinarily, we would pause for a couple of questions, but I think, if that's okay with everyone, it, it, this links so well that we should move on to the unveiling and the uh, few words from, from the uh, portrait painter and the sitter and then have a, a big open discussion about all of these aspects of um, painting portraits, viewing portraits, being a sitter for a portrait. I think they all link up so well. So perhaps I could uh, introduce someone who now needs no introduction. <laughs> um, uh, Peter Brown is a, is a, um, a member of the, Royal, of the Royal Society of Portrait Painters. Um, paints, I was interested to see from, solely from life, um, whether uh, that is uh, plein air paintings of London and Bath, where for some reason, that I'm sure he'll explain, he's known as Pete the Street. Uh, but to us today, he's, he's uh, Peter Brown, <laughs> RP. Uh, he's painted his son... Toby, and he's going to unveil the painting for us, tell us a little bit about it, and perhaps a little bit of discussion between the two of you, and then we'll open up for general discussions on all three presentations. So, may I hand over, Mr. Street? <laughs> Mr. Street, I'm going to, I'm going to stand up, because it's a walk, I'm going to walk around a bit, but um, um, Lady Howell, you started your talk today talking about imposter syndrome. Well... I feel very, very unqualified in, this, in the presence of all these people today, um, but I feel very qualified in saying, you don't know you're born. I feel very, uh, very much like an imposter here, um, particularly after that very eloquent speech by, by Carol. Um, and I, I, after, after what she said about the painting, I feel like we should just leave it at that. It was so nice. Um, <laughs> So uh, I just quickly, I just want to quickly just show you kind of what, so not only am I an imposter in Cambridge, but I'm also an imposter really in the Royal Society of Portrait Painters, and, and Ben, who, who is a member, will be able to tell you that um, I was quite a contentious election um, some time ago, because um, I'm not really a, a, a portrait painter in the sense of an, uh, uh, someone who analytically examines um, the head. This is the wrong way around. Uh, this is the sort of thing I normally do, which is painting um, street scenes of, uh, hang on. So street scenes of London, uh, which I do sort of on this, this, this manky old easel. Um, and um, uh, so sort of standing in the middle of the street and painting, and painting this is what I normally do. So this isn't what I normally do, this is my excuse. It's, it's, this is the most stressful moment of my life, I have to say. Um, <laughs> It, doing commissions is very hard, um, but doing this and then unveiling it in front of all you people is, is absolutely um, buttock clenching. But um, so, uh, so we're just going to do it. So, uh, so I'll just, yeah, I'll just, oh, I just do it. I just can't think of anything else to do. So here we go. We nearly lost it off the easel earlier on, actually. So here we go. So there we go. So that's it. Uh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I guess we, we should just chat about it now. But um, so it was just briefly. Um, it was. It says in the in the in the brochure thing. But it, I started it as 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 Carol said, the mistress said in um, when Toby was studying for his A levels, um, and um, it was uh, a, just a kind of scene in our in our dining room. Um, uh, dining room tables don't get used for eating on at all anymore, and, and all our kids do, all their revision, all their stuff all over our dining room. And I just thought it was kind of a chaotic mental scene that I wanted to capture. And also, very proud of Toby, who is, as any porter in this place will know, is a, quite a character, and uh, to put it mildly. And um, it, when he really decided to knuckle down and really go for something, and um, so it was a very proud moment for me, and I knew what he was going for, uh, and if he succeeded, it would have been great. Um, but I'm his dad, and whatever he did was going to be brilliant anyway. So it's a very proud moment. And of course, I had painted it, and I've spoken to, to Ben and the committee who accept these paintings about putting it in. And they said, we don't think it would be a very good idea to, to accept it now, because Toby would be very embarrassed to have this painting on the wall, because they don't know what Toby's like. He would have absolutely <laughs> loved it. But, um, and I was quite pleased, actually, because I wasn't, you know, as an artist, you're constantly questioning yourself. 
uh, you constantly have that problem with confidence. Uh, and, and so when you've got this painting in your house all the time, you look at it and thinking you're seeing all the things that are wrong in it. And over that time, I became more and more unhappy with it. And then as Toby came back to study for his finals, uh, it was in about April. I'm not sure quite why. Was it lockdown or something? I'm not really sure. But he was, no, you were just not sure. I think it came no. back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So... Um, Toby, yeah, cha probably, yeah, just disappeared. So you, cha head. you changed your hair, Toby. It was now. It wasn't officially back, Dad. Oh, oh. No, I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm guessing. <laughs> All right, it's a tricky moment. Okay, but we, we've got the, we've got it in our hand. We've got the uh, got the certificate now. So Toby had painted his hair, uh, painted, dyed his hair pink, and just thought it'd be a good time to sort of update it. And so I changed his clothes and and um, and, and changed the colour of his hair. So um, so that was it. And in that time, Toby had produced this. This is a Girton. Uh, so Pembroke Girton combined rugby team. I know because when they were talking about the objects, I was like, "There's no way you'll put an object as a symbol symbolism in your painting." I was like, "We actually did with that hat." I was like, "Dad, can you put the Purton hat in it?" Because yeah. I wanted the. So it's quite it's quite nice that you got involved in actually sort of choosing what was. And I composed all the files too, I guess. Didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> that was the same mayhem, yeah. yeah. But it's it's lovely to yeah. I mean it's. As I say, I'm a, I, I've all of all I've ever done really in, t in terms of portrait painting is paint my children at a distance, looking away. <laughs> so it's kind of like it's all about a, a uh, just a scene, really. Uh, you know, family life, I guess. Um, so it's quite interesting. Many of them end up in our house. So this one, Tobes, is staying here. And yeah, what that's I want, that's so what I wanted to ask you in front of all these people is, what? How do you feel about this? You leaving Girton? And the painting staying here, is that something... You... Well, I want to stay with it, to be honest. But, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I feel... I, it's cool. It's, we we um, walk through the People's Portrait Galleries all the time, and they're all amazing paintings. So, yeah, it's going to be so weird walking past and that's hanging of me there. So I actually don't know if I would have liked it being here, because if you walk past yourself every day, it would be odd. Um, but, yeah, and you captured me with pink hair. I'm not sure how I feel like that, because that was for... I was for the Girton Spring Ball, so that for one night. And now that's the only lasting thing of me in a college with that pink hair. Yeah. It was a good ball, though. It was really good, yeah, it was. It was. And so and, and um, so when I paint you, because the kids, the kids hate me painting them. Some don't mind sitting there, but um, Ella particularly, our, our, our youngest daughter, absolutely hates it. it no matter how much money you throw at her. Um, but, but you didn't seem to mind it. I mean, were you aware of me when, I, when you were working and I was painting you? Well, yeah, so you, yeah, it's hard to concentrate, really, because you, you, you chat, firstly, a lot, but also just knowing you're sort of watching, it's quite hard to, like, keep working. But, yeah, it was fine because I was just studying. I could sit there normally. But me and Ella have both got ADHD, so we can't sit still for long normally. <laughs> but, um, yeah, with this, we were in full-on study mode, and, yeah, it was fine, yeah. But, yeah, having you there, like, painting you, and you know you're being watched and literally captured, it's kind of weird. You can't, like, lose yourself in the work, not that I was lost in my work, to be honest. <laughs> but there's a, there's, a, there's a um so when i paint on the street is um i try and capture figures um and um so figures that i capture very often are well very often they're mongrels so i can capture someone's leg and then they've gone so i then find someone else and i can maybe assemble figures but you find that people are um so i'm people watching all the time in a way and it's a similar similar thing um and you find that some people, doesn't matter how athletic they are or sedentary they seem, some people are fidgeters and some people aren't. And some people just cannot sit still for one minute. They're constantly doing this and doing that. Is that me? And no, you were actually quite good. So it's really funny that that when when you work, you actually do stay still and or there are three kind of poses that you'll do and you'll yeah, go back to I'll have my hand on my leg or something and dad will say oh, can you just stay there and it'll be a really uncomfortable position and you'll be going to you get two more minutes and you're just in a weird <laughs> position your hands are it's really annoying I don't hate this one I'm not saying I hate the whole thing it was fine I don't <laughs> it was okay but yeah it's, I always feel really sorry for people and lady hell you, you sat for Ben of course so I always feel really sorry for people who've had to sit and, and have a portrait I couldn't do it for a minute and uh I, I, you know, I think it's one of the things that a poor queen, I mean, flipping heck, you know. Yeah. Is, yeah. Um, but um, so, I, so, yeah, so I think that's the nice thing about capturing people doing things that kind of they're not necessarily just sitting and looking at you. It makes it probably a bit more comfortable for you and easy for you. Yeah, so. Uh, Can I set off a little bit of, of cute questions? Because you, you, you've, I, I, there's a really interesting contrast here between the sort of analysis of the 
you know, what's in there and how deliberately it's there and where it's leading us. And then, I mean this in a good way, but there's a slightly more kind of chaotic sense about whether something's in or something's not in. And I wonder how, if there's some reconciliation of, of this. Well, I, I, I was going to ask you, Peter, whether, you know, my, my attempt to analyse your, or to discuss your painting was a... Um, you it know, was, rang true at all, or, well, or you know, it's it? it's 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 lovely. I mean, I think you know, as, as a it, that's why I didn't want to take the thing off because I thought you'd, you'd said you'd painted a much better painting in your <laughs> own words. But I think um, you know, as artists, you just do it. You know, and I don't, and especially me, I've I've always said there's there's very little between here sort of thing. So um, uh, so I just chuck it on and. Um, and you hope that some art happens in the middle. You know, it happens in a way. And, and hopefully, um, you know, uh, that it's, uh, there's something subconscious, hopefully, that goes on. That it's, and it's interesting. All those things you say are, are very... I mean, I th I'd love it. I, I, want, I need that writing. To, to, <laughs> right. but, um, um, but I don't think... I don't, consci I don't think... I'm not conscious thinking about painting. Mm. I mean, Side's very interesting, the hairdresser painting. I mean, you, you know Side's painting, and you know Side well, Ben. He's... Very analytical, and everything is very, very precise and beautifully worked out compositionally. He's terribly intellectual, and so there's so much thought that goes into them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I'm more of a painter who kind of sees something and goes, wow, that looks good. And, mm -hmm. and so it's um, a bit more guttural, really. Yeah. But um, so, I, you know, and, and I've huge, huge, we always have huge admiration for the, the things we don't do. And I, um, I sit in awe at Side, you know, yeah, Side's right. work is incredible. Well, I, I should say that I'm, I'm a reportage illustrator, so I too. Yeah basically run around drawing people without them noticing right. most of the time, as people here may know, um, and indeed making up hybrid images yes. from, you know, <laughs> an elbow here of somebody and a, you know, a rucksack there or somebody yeah. else. Um, so that engages a completely different part of my brain and in intentionality of the sort that I've sort of, you know, suggested yeah. is present in the portraits is, is not, for me too, as an artist, it's not there really. No. So, you know, I guess... I, Maybe one day somebody will do the same for me. And <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my just desserts. <laughs> but it, it sort of feels though as if there's like an, an in the an in the middle. You know, there's the um, you know beautifully arranged, you know, mirror scene, right. and then there's the, mm. the, the running about and uh, mm -hmm. you know, Carrie did a fantastic caught me in the garden. I didn't even know and just just some absolutely amazing, brilliant. But you know, you don't you don't know it's happening. Mm. Whereas in your painting if I could say both of yours it it feels as if there was like a bit of a, a bit a bit of to and fro that actually you know uh, Toby you know had yeah. quite a bit of input into what that looked like and I wonder is that unusual is that just special because it's a family team or? well dad did all the brushworks so I didn't do anything on the, <laughs> on the painting but uh yeah, I don't know if it's usual but well, I, I, mean, I just want I really wanted the Purton hat in it um just so I could tell my friends on the rugby team, really. And then, um, but I don't know, you, you, to be fair, Dad arranges me and tells me what to do, really. So I don't have too much input, really. No, I, I can't, yeah. but yeah. But it must be, I mean, you must be conscious I'm painting you, so yeah. there an element of that. Yeah. There. But yeah, there's a, there's a beauty in, in just capturing, yeah. yeah, capturing people without them knowing. I mean, that, then that, Absolutely. that yeah. the flick of you the pen or thing. Yeah, and, just amazing. And yeah. you're right, so there's an accent, isn't there? There's an accent yeah. of... Mm -hmm. Sometimes how um, people are standing, mm. so you can. So it's very often people will start to do a cheesy commission for someone, and they'll say, "Can you put me in the painting?" You know, mm. and it's always a little bit of an afterthought. But sometimes you can get them in there mainly because they know it's them, so mm. they're expecting to see a, a, a peach shaped blob in there or something. But also there's a there's a way someone stands sometimes, isn't there? There's yeah. a sort of a sort of yeah a, an attitude about a body <laughs> that sort of says a lot about them that is them in a way, which yes. is and amazing I, to catch. I really think your, your distinction between about you know, whether you focus on the face or the body is, right. is a really interesting one as well because those portraits I was talking about, you know, in that other tradition are, are very much about face, I think. Well, I think so. Yeah. Whereas, you know, your work here is is much more about that idea of a body in a space <coughs> surrounded by objects and the kind of all the relationships that are going on between these different forms. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. so... Yeah, very Yeah, about the space more, yeah. yeah but, um, I mean, the, what you said about a dentist was terrifying. I'm glad, <laughs> glad I'd had my lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it also makes me wonder about, uh, 
uh, those two different models of, you know, and you, you were saying, you know, you, you, you do that in London as well, you capture a leg and stick it on a body, or you see somebody go by and you capture the, um, the, the attitude. Um, I, I'm kind of wondering whether those kind of models capture something a bit more essential about a sitter, or, well, they're not sitting, are they? A non-sitter, than, than if a person sits. You know, the person sits, can you... I've looked with a photographer over there, so it's quite interesting. If you know they're taking a photo of you, you're quite different, aren't you, than if you're just... And I just wondered if there's anything in that about painting. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if I ask someone to... If you ask anyone to sit for you, to reference... And, I mean, I don't know what you find, Ben, but as a portrait, but... but whether you, how much direction you give them or what you tell them to do or whether they stand. But I know certainly when I'm doing, I've been painting Glastonbury recently and people always say, can I go in it? And the problem with that is they stand there like you're taking a photograph of them. And you don't want that. You want it like, you know, people are walking by and smoking weed or whatever they're doing. But you don't want that sort of standing. So it's that, that's... Because it's, as you're saying, it's the observation, isn't it, of life in your life? It is. I mean, I think, there, I'm sure, yeah, Ben, obviously... As a portrait painter, have have things to say about this. So, um, but the, I mean, I, I do find there's a sort of tension when when you look at somebody's face and you ask them to sit. I find between, you know, somehow capturing that that fleeting essence and then maybe trying to get to something else underneath. Yeah. Um, I think there are there's sort of two different things yeah. at work there, and. Uh, which I struggle with in my own work. I mean, I've, I've done quite a lot of portraiture, or not portraiture, I hasten to add, but drawings of people around the place and portraits. Indeed, I did draw Susan, make, forced her to sit for some time <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> not as well as and, and not, oh, well, there we go. Um, and and that's, that was quite a different image from the one that you just described of the, the, when I sort of basically stalked you in the garden. <laughs> and, well, <I> <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, you get two different sort of ideas of the person through these two different traditions. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you have any views on, on this well, yourself. I mean, I always try to not choreograph people. Mm. Really, but, um, I mean, I think that's... Whether I'm successful or not, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, I think, you know, doing... Having both Susan and uh, Baroness Hale sat for me, I mean, they gave me huge, uh, you know, hours and hours of sitting that I was very thankful for. And as you said, that, uh, it's the dance over that, the, the many hours that you sit. Mm. But for, for us, because you paint us all the time, it's like we're never, we're never choreographed or posed because we're not really even sitting for you, really. We're, we're doing things or like... And you paint us all the time, so for us it feels... Yeah, I, that's why it's, I feel weird being called a sitter because like, I was just working yeah. and you're just a painter and you just always <laughs> paint me because that's... You know what I mean? It just seems like natural, I guess. Obviously, I am yeah. natural because I... Yeah. But the thing, the thing that I'm missing, if you like, that a portrait painter is getting is the relationship between the sitter and a portrait painter. And it must be, that, must be fascinating, that getting to know people you know, over a period of time, um, whether it be through conversation or just, you know, people's mannerisms must be... Yeah, it must be amazing. And when, when, when I have to go and do a painting, if it was a commission, it's very... You, you get a bit nervous about, oh, God, can I pull it off? And at the end, you think, oh, I think I did, and that's great. But, it, you know, to come for a, a sat portrait and to have a success at the end of it, or, you know, and to have gone through that whole process must be incredible. Yeah, I think that's, that's really an interesting way that you, that you put it. I hadn't really thought about that. The, the painting itself develops as the relationship. I hadn't really, obviously, because I don't paint portraits, I hadn't really thought of that before. But look, there, there must be people in the room who've got some questions and comments that they'd like to ask, and we can continue the conversation in more collaboratively if, if people would like to. Otherwise, we'll carry on. Uh, so should somebody have a, a microphone? I'm just looking. OK, <laughs> a loud voice. OK, we're going to pass microphones because it's great for the... Um, I say I'll start with an anecdote, and it leads to a question. Uh, with my book group, we read a book called The Portrait by Ian Pears, or Pears, I'm not sure which in which uh, you never hear the subject speak. The entire book is a monologue by the artist to the sitter. And he is describing, as he paints, why he's doing it in a certain way. This green that I'm using now, this is to bring out that jealous side of your nature, and so on. And I, so my question is, were you in any way conscious of the way you painted, trying to bring out the character of your son? 
golly. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of in a way, I guess. Uh, that's really hard because I say I'm quite a guttural painter. You know, I don't, I try not to think too much. Um, so in a way, I'd probably have to say no, not really, I think. I just, just painted kind of what was, what I think was there, you know, in my own way sort of thing and, and try not to think too much of it. I think, you, 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 yeah, I, I, you know your limits. I'm, I'm my, and I am not a, a great thinker. So, you know... Uh, putting in any sort of symbolism in any way deliberately, I know is a bit of a dead end for me, really, because it's, it's not going to it's not gonna work. So I think I'll probably just say no. So that's <laughs> Thanks. I'm just sort of prompted to think about time a bit, because that's come up, partly about the amount of some discussion of the amount of time that's spent with the sitter. Uh, the, and the, the, uh, the sheer amount of gaze. I mean, it occurred to me, you know, partly through the wonderful experience of living with these people, por people's portraits sort of over all the time I was chaplain and feeling like they were neighbours, I realised that most of the time when you go and see a portrait in a gallery and you, you, you've got an hour or two in that gallery, there's lots of paintings, you don't spend that much time with each portrait. And you know for sure that you've only spent perhaps a hundredth of the time looking at the portrait that the actual painter spent putting the paint on and looking at the person. So in that sense, there's an overplus. There's, there's always more in a portrait than most viewers can ever see. And one of the effects of this exhibition is that you keep coming past the same portrait again day after day. And something else is disclosed. So I'm wondering, particularly with Peter and Toby, that, that there's the time you spent on the portrait, but then there's, that, there's a whole lifetime of being father and son. You know, how far you've put more into the painting, perhaps, than even you would know. And you were saying, Toby, that it would be a bit weird to see it while you were still a student but you let it go. But I don't know how you feel about people gradually getting to know you <laughs> without your... Because I, I feel like after sort of 20 years or so in the college that some of these portraits feel like friends and neighbours to me. And I think that's only because there's more in them than, say, a photograph could ever have had. There's more personal knowledge coming out of that portrait. So I just wanted some reflection from all of you on the time you take to paint it the time we take to see it, what it is to live with it. Well, I'd, thank you, Malcolm. Um, one of the things I, I suppose I wanted to say when Peter was talking about the, the process a bit was um, that the portraits also invoke the artist, and so that's the other presence that haunts this. And I could have, you know, com uh, structured a, a, a talk around that idea of... Um, the invisible presence of the artist in, in the portrait itself, of course. Um, with all of those, all of those uh, connotations and the, the kind of the, the lifetime of experience that the artist might have brought to the painting. So uh, they are indeed about the kind of the, the physical embodiment of the artist and that encounter in the sitting as well. Um, and I also wanted just to add that when you were talking about, you know, we were talking about sitting and, and so on, um, that, that it's a high wire act as well, and, and you know when you you mentioned Pete, that you never quite know how something's going to turn out, <laughs> and, I, and perhaps that's something that you know sitters and indeed an audience might attribute to the artist, possibly wrongly, that they have a, an authority and a knowledge that before they begin that will enable them to sort of, you know, make the leap to the finished p painting that you see, and that's from my point of view anyway as an artist, it's not the case. So, you know, there's a kind of internal process that is also present in the making of a portrait and that you know I think we're lucky to have very lucky to have the artist here today so you can get a, an insight into that a glimpse of that as well of what that process might be and then it's kind of emotional and it's situational and circumstantial as well yeah, no, so you, you, mm. yeah, I think you're right that you, you you don't know what what's going to happen do you really but um 
But to, to go back to the, the time thing, it's the, the, the Picasso quote when he does he does a sketch and it takes three seconds and the interviewer says, you know, this took you three seconds and it, it's worth £20,000 for three seconds. Work. And then Picasso says, it's not, it's 45 years of, you know, work and three seconds sort of thing. It's a sort of, not, not, I'm not likening myself to Picasso, don't get me wrong, but um, in, in a way, because I'd known Toby as well, before I started even painting, there's a familiarity and it's the same with, all sorts and in, with buildings, you know, if I paint Piccadilly, I know Piccadilly so well, there's a familiarity. So when you start a painting, you're already that much further, you know, and then you're starting from that point. So you're kind of constantly trying to hopefully, I always look at you're constantly trying to lift another veil, you're trying to get a little bit further and a little bit further down the line. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, as you say, you had a time spent on it. I mean, I don't know what this, the stats are. It's horrendous, isn't it? The amount of time we spend in front of a painting is, when we go through a gallery, it's, I don't know, seconds, isn't it? And, it's, and that's true of us all. Um, but that's, that's really lovely, and I love the idea of, yeah, all, of this community of portraits here. It's just, uh, it's just a, it's a, lovely, a lovely idea, you know, that, you, that you've, you've developed French, uh, relationships with these paintings. Uh, it's lovely. There's a wonderful painting there, actually, which... Um, a friend of mine, Jason Bowyer, sadly died about four years ago. So Bill Bowyer's son, William Bowyer's son, who did the dentist uh, painting, uh, of a, uh, is it a Brentford or a Fulham football fan, I think? It's just, you know, which I just love. It's this guy bulging out of his football shirt. And, you know, Jason is a massive, was a massive Fulham or Brentford. I think it's Fulham, actually. But anyway, um, fan. So, you know, there's that, that, that relationship, that sort of almost self-portrait bit about it, you know, which is... Always the case, I think, yeah. That's really, I, didn't, I hadn't picked that up at all, that there was a relationship there. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I was also thinking about the connections between the portraits as they hang in, in Girton. So uh, your point, Malcolm, is, is sort of, uh, I might develop it to say, um, we could also look at the way the portraits speak to each other in their hanging, in their position, I, which I know is very carefully planned by um, the curatorial committee as well. So, um, you know, again, there are other sort of, threads and connections between all of them and you know, I don't know what, where, where yours will be hung in the end but um, I hope... Probably in the loo I expect. <laughs> <laughs> um, a set of, you know, generative sort of, uh, relationships between yeah. the, its, the portrait and its surroundings as well. So I think in the hanging and in the content one might be able to read too much into it because there's also the size and shape yeah. question, yeah. you know. So it's yeah. So it's an inter it's an interesting dynamic, and it brings me to the question actually about your your decision to you know somebody you've got a very close relationship with, you know very well. You could do a real kind of close up. It could just do an eye and a nose or something, and you know there'd be everything that you know in that. But you've actually taken a a span of the of the room and and and. Presumably that's your ho home. Yeah, it is. And yeah, yeah, no. Well, that's my question, really. Though. So the whole so portrait. It's, it's, it's because you can't do close-ups. Is, 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 is it because I can't do close-ups, Dad? I think there's a lot of truth in that, I think, actually. Yeah, um, but we'll skip through that, too, if you don't mind. We'll just find, find, find another reason. So the, the one thing about doing this is it's... Um, is it's quite selfish in a way. You're just really doing it on the whole for, for yourself because you do them and then you, whatever happens to them, happens to them. But it's a really lovely way. We're talking about investing time in doing the portrait and it's a really lovely way of remembering a moment. So talking about when you point your iPhone, when you're sitting on the beach with all your kids and you point your iPhone, it's a way of remembering and that's fine. It goes into your iPhotos and you can recall them a year later or whatever. But if you sit there and try and draw them building a sandcastle, or you're drawing them and Granny's singing a mad song, Lisa, or something like that, then you, while, as you're drawing it, it's taking, it's taking time to do it, and then you're committing it to memory, your brain using different parts of your brain. I don't know, I'm sure people in this room could tell me what's going on, but because but you're getting more involved in the process, it's a lovely way of remembering. And so it's, um, it's, it's almost addictive as well, because you, can't, you see things happening, and you think... Um, Rather than just living in the moment, sometimes you want to record it. So, kind of, you, is, is, is a constant battle between just build a sandcastle with Toby and have a nice time, or draw Toby building a sandcastle. It's a very interesting thing, that, um, and it's very selfish, very, very self-indulgent. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop. Hold it there. Yeah, but yeah. <coughs> Uh, thank you so much, and I just wanted to pick up from the last statement that Susan made in which she drew, drew attention to the room. 
I wanted to say, I have never seen such a wonderful picture of paper. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 there was a great vogue in early portrait painting of uh, painting someone reading. I mean, you find portrait after portrait of a person reading. Um, I'm not sure, if I may, whether you're reading or writing. It doesn't matter, because in front of the computer, you can be doing both at the same time. But the paper that surrounds is brilliant. And I don't know, I connect to that, I connect to the paper, the files, the <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to say, so it's an enormous pleasure to see it. Oh, that's so it lovely. Wasn't really Thank you very much. That's comment. very kind. Yeah, the paper I just wanted to pick up and clear up, frankly, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> when it goes to that table, goes to different guises. So Ella's just finished her GCSE, so she was all over that table then. It's just very interesting seeing. There's a wonderful song by, sorry, this has nothing to do with painting, by Beautiful South, which is all about a table and how a table is used in many different ways. It ends up being, it threatens, if you say, you keep abusing me, I'm going to, turn, I'm going to turn to the coffin in your grave. It's all about wood and it's wonderful and it's just like, uh, it's, the life of that table is as much as, you know, the painting is as much about the life of that table and the stuff that happens to it as anything else probably. Thank you very much. And, and I just would like to say that as Toby's former director of studies, I would have been so glad to see this picture and to know that actually all that time in lockdown at home, he was actually doing some work. So, <laughs> <laughs> And actually that has borne fruit in the very good degree he's just been <laughs> awarded. So um, I suppose my, my question in a way picks up on quite a lot of what's been said before because in a way this picture both spans a long period of time in that the room, I guess, is the same as it has been and will stay the same, and it's a record of, you know, one family's dining room and so on. But the actual specificity of the, the paper on the table and the books and the, the, you know, the revision that's going on is a moment in time because actually that's something that probably Toby is very glad is, is past. Um, um, and, and so I was, I was just thinking in comparison with, say, the butcher or um, the hairdresser, that is an ongoing picture of their lives. And this, in a way, is a picture of a, a snapshot of Toby's life, which has now passed. And I don't know if any of you got any comment on that sort of dual temporality that's going on there. I suppose it, it does have a, a dual a dual life, then, doesn't it? It, it will, it, you know, it's both both a, a record of this specific moment in in Toby's life. But for the people who don't know Toby, who will see the portrait, it, it's also like the butcher and so on. It 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 will, you know, continue to just resonate um, as this well, what I call a, a threshold moment, where we're sort of it's that kind of shimmer of hesitation between past and present that I think this picture captures, as well as having the autobiographical element that we, you know, we have the, in, the insight into today. So it's a sort of both and rather than either or. Yeah. And yeah, so at the moment, so both times when I was obviously really stressed, so when I was first revising to try and get the grades to come here and revising to do the degree. Um, yeah, it was obviously a moment of like massive stress before. And when Dad started painting, I remember you saying, we can get you into Girton one way or another. So if I don't get in, we can get you get the painting. <laughs> <laughs> get the painting into Girton. But like, yeah, it's nice, it's nice looking back because obviously it's really stressful and it, it worked out well so far. <laughs> can, can, I, can I just ask another question? I'm just sort of going back to the first part of your talk, Carol, and I... I don't know, that, uh, the message I received, and it may well not be exactly what you, you said, but I w it made me think that the, that the paintings in the hall, which are the portraits of the mistress, mm. I got, you seem to be saying they are a representation of the office, the office of the mistress. Oh, yes. And whereas, for example, the people's portraits were, you know, had more trajectory. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, I was, I was making a distinction. I mean, one that... I'm sure people might argue with, but uh, for the purposes of, yes. Well, specifically the portrait that uh, Ben painted of you, I was just very interested in the actual arrangement of the two panels. If, if you remember, the mistress sits on top of a panel which shows 
I think it's the rear, is it the rear? No, the front elevation, of course, of, of, of the college. And that reminded me of that idea that you see in icon paintings of um, the spirit over, this is not too grand to say, but the, the spirit of the college and that idea of indeed a kind of office holder um, whose, whose, whose spirit passes through the office and, and you know, is passed on. Thinking so, about different portrait traditions and they overlap. So the, the portrait of Mary Cartwright, the two portraits that are in the college, uh, seem quite different to me. Um, even though they were, they were painted at more or less the same time, 1958, 1961, I believe. So that, that's, I'm not really making a... These, these traditions exist uh, alongside each other rather than being successive. Um, but yes, I, I've sort of pondered the reason why students, for instance, maybe Toby, you can comment on this, but don't appear to notice the portraits in the dining hall. <laughs> Although I did once see some students talking rather animatedly about one of them, but um, that seemed an exception rather than the rule. And I wondered if it might be something to do with this, what I'm positing about this idea of, if you like, movie time that we're used to. We kind of, the images we see in popular culture are all about successive time. So we see an image and we immediately, our brains are kind of, um, queued up to think that there's a beforehand and an afterhand. These are kind of mo snapshots, moments. Whereas, and, you know, we scroll on our phones. Your generation scrolls on their phones all the time. Uh, but those images are about, to me, that sort of idea of stasis and timelessness. So I wondered if they're less visible, <laughs> in a way, to your generation. If they're, uh, you know, what, what, it, what interest they have yeah. to you. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I haven't had massive conversations with people talking about those paintings, really. I think the, well, obviously the people, people's portraits have things going on in them that are happening that's like to talk about outside the painting itself, I guess, so it's more, more drawn to them. But yeah, I think you could be right, yeah. I mean, I go on TikTok a lot. I'm scrolling through my phone a lot, so our, our attention spans are pretty poor, poor I think, so, yeah. yeah. But also, there's a, there's a, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's, they're hung in, in the dining hall, aren't they? So you expect, it's like in here, you expect these paintings to be hung here, and because you expect them to be hung here, you don't look at them because they're, 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 they become wallpaper. I mean, I don't, you know, but it, that's, they don't, they're not, obviously, but, you know, that's, we, we expect them, so yeah, we don't look a, at them in a way. There's a function so. from the context yeah, yeah. Yeah, that determines how we look at things. So it's, yeah. really, it's, really, no, sorry, it's really nice seeing them on the walls in, in what he calls schlub, or social hub, um, because... Because they're in a contemporary environment, it's an interesting thing in the contemporary environment where lots of things going on and, you, and so they jump out a bit more in a way, don't they? Just kind of, sort of simply from where they're hung, I guess. Um, anyway. I think what people do see, though, when they come from other institutions, mm. certain ones down the road, but generally other institutions, I do think they do see that they're all women. Mm. And, uh, and, and, of course, in the future, it'll be a much more diverse group, even if it's a diverse group of women. But it is most unusual to go into a mixed college yeah. and find yeah. only women on the walls, yes. which uh, is, I think, a triumph. I, I agree, and that, that struck me when I first came, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, one last question, I think, at the back there. Ruth Yule. A slightly trivial observation, perhaps, but the former chaplain did not mention that the portraits speak to each other when they are not observed. <laughs> if you don't already re re know it, may I recommend Portraits by Moonlight. Google it. It's on Malcolm's website. Um, the portraits were very perturbed during lockdown that the students hadn't come back and it was all so quiet. And then I heard a voice ring out from down the dining hall a voice of true authority was summoning them all. And it was, of course, Emily Davis, <laughs> putting them to rights and telling them it would all be all right eventually. <laughs> so they're far more animated than you think. <laughs> Oh, we've had a really fantastic session, haven't we? It's sadly coming to the, to the en end of it. And uh, it's a packed day, isn't it? My goodness. Um, I would really like to thank um, uh, Pete and Toby and Carol for a really fantastic, lively session. Thank you so much for the portrait. You can see that it has made a, a ripple. And for all the um, qualifications you made, uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic addition to the collection with the added 
uh, added extra of having one of our own OGs uh, <laughs> on the wall. So thank you so much for the painting. Thank you for the talk. And Carol, thank you for your intervention. And thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been fantastic. <laughs>